Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our risen Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for the address today is from the Gospel reading, John chapter 20, verses 19 to 31. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we listen to your word today, let your spirit fill us with hope and faith and joy. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a book that some of you would know by a man named Dietrich Bonhoeffer called Life Together. It's a real spiritual classic on the theme of Christian community. And I think it's very relevant and helpful for us right now as we live through this strange time in the church of not being able to meet together as we normally do. So, for example, in the very first paragraph of that book, here's what Bonhoeffer writes, and it really hits me at the moment when I read this. Quote, It is not simply to be taken for granted that the Christian has the privilege of living among other Christians. It is by the grace of God that a congregation is permitted to gather visibly in this world to share God's word and sacrament. Aren't we right now, so many of us, learning the truth of these words? And so from our text today, I'd like to take the opportunity to meditate on the theme of Christian community. What is it? Where does it come from? What does it mean? And from our text, I'd like to draw out four points for today. We see here that Christian community, first, it gathers regularly. Second, that it's made up of sinners. Third, that it's centred on Christ. And fourth, that it's sent out into the world. So number one, Christian community gathers regularly. Notice that right after the resurrection, in the very first weeks, we already find the disciples of Jesus Christ in some sort of a regular rhythm of gathering together. We read, when it was evening, on that day, the first day of the week, Sunday, they're all together. And then we read again, a week later, his disciples were again in the house. So the next Sunday, they are together again. Already, right there, after Jesus' resurrection, we have the disciples meeting on two consecutive Sundays. And meeting on that day, the day of Christ's resurrection Sunday, this is a custom in the Christian church which has continued right down until today. And notice something else here, that after Jesus' resurrection, as he appears to the disciples, it's almost always as they are gathered as a group in community. Even when there are instances when Jesus does encounter someone one-on-one, -on -one, like he does with Mary Magdalene, you get the sense there that that's an exception because he immediately sends her back to the other disciples, back into community. And you can trace this same theme of Christian community regularly gathering through the early church in the book of Acts. So as the Christian gospel is going out and people are being brought to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ, we hear this little summary statement, that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Later on in the New Testament, the writer to the Hebrews will remind the early Christians, do not neglect meeting together, as is the habit of some, but encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. This is number one. This is fundamental. That Christian community gathers regularly. But how does this apply to us right now when we can't do that, you might ask? Well, I'd like to make one very simple point of application here of this principle, and it's to do 
with the use of technology that we're using right now, today. On the one hand, I'd say that we can be incredibly thankful to have technology that Bonhoeffer never dreamed of, to stay connected in our life together. We can continue in these limited ways online and through television and other media. These are wonderful opportunities as well because they're opportunities to reach out to people who perhaps wouldn't normally come to our churches. But on the other hand, as we use this technology, I think it's healthy that we also acknowledge its limits. Because online worship, online ministry, These are not substitutes or replacements for the true gathering of the Christian community around word and sacrament. So while we can be thankful for what it is, these new technologies, let us not become too comfortable with them. They are temporary. They are better than nothing measures. But our text reminds us that the disciples of Jesus Christ gathered in the flesh. They looked one another in the eye. Thomas reached out and touched Jesus. True Christian community is physical. It's incarnate. And perhaps this is a good time in the life of the church for us to learn this, to treasure more deeply the gift of Christian community and to long for the time when we can gather together once again. This is number one. Christian community gathers regularly. Number two, Christian community is made up of sinners. Here we are in our text after the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The event, the resurrection of Jesus, which is at the center of God's plans for the redemption of the whole cosmos, And what sort of community do we find growing out of this most wonderful event? Well, we find a motley crew hiding away behind locked doors in fear. They had denied him. They had deserted him. And now some of them were doubting him. Deniers, deserters, and doubters. Hardly the thriving community you might think you would find associated with the one who had just conquered death and the grave. From its earliest days, the Christian community has not been a place where everyone's faith was always strong with no struggles where everyone always did the right thing and never slipped up, where it's all pristine and harmonious all the time. It's just never been like that. Not from the very first days, not until today. That's not real Christian community. Read the rest of the New Testament. Many of the letters of Paul, for example, are dealing with problems in the early Christian church. And they're dealing with problems which make some of our issues look very tame, let me tell you. You go and read about what was going on in Corinth in the Corinthian Christian congregation. I guarantee you they did not teach you about what was happening there in Sunday school. And yet at the start of all of those letters, what's so amazing is that these problem congregations, as they're greeted, they are greeted as the church of God as those who are being sanctified, as saints. In other words, Paul does not write to them and say, if you guys were a real Christian community, you wouldn't have these problems. No, it's the opposite. He knows that true Christian community will always have its problems because it's made up of sinners. And the application here is quite simple. It's that as wonderful a gift as life together with other Christians is, we should not be surprised when it's messy, when it's difficult, when it's hard, when you discover that you're actually living together with real sinners in need of real forgiveness from a real Christ. 
real sinners just like you, real sinners just like me. And this leads us to our next and most important point, which is that Christian community is centred on Jesus Christ and the gifts he brings. So what is it that creates this Christian community and holds it together and truly makes it what it is? What is it? It's not us. It's Christ. It's what he does for us. That's the big emphasis in our text. It's not just that the disciples gather regularly that make them a Christian community. It's not even that they just acknowledge their need and their unworthiness. Any group of people can gather regularly and any support group can acknowledge a shared weakness. They are helpful, but those groups are not the church. The true Christian community exists because of what we hear in this text, that Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. It's the presence of Jesus Christ in our midst as we gather. That is the essence of our life together. And notice it's Jesus with his wounds. In other words, it's the crucified Jesus. Jesus who suffered and died for you so that he can bring you that peace. It's this Jesus now raised from the dead who is present in our midst as we gather so he can speak that peace to us. Speak it through his authorised messengers he sends us, through his pastors and ministers. Jesus comes and he stands among us. And just as he did for those first disciples, he breathes on us his Holy Spirit. Each and every time we gather, we receive anew, we receive afresh the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on our community and on us as individuals. Jesus comes and he stands among us and he does this as one who does not come to condemn us for our doubts, to condemn us for our struggles in faith, but he comes as one who reaches out to the struggler, who comes to Thomas to reveal himself, who says, Reach out and see my wounds. Put your hand here. Do not doubt, but believe. And please notice this, that the Christian community is not centred on Christ as if Christ is just some idea. It's not that we're bound together by an idea, by a common cause, or even just by a common body of teaching as important as that is. But we are centred on Christ in the sense that we are centred, we are focused on the actual, real presence of Christ with us. The risen Christ. He is among us. He creates and sustains our life together by His Spirit, through His Word, and through His body and blood, as we receive Him in the sacrament. And so as we live through this time of being scattered as the people of God, isolated from one another. As we seek to find ways of growing in Christ as individuals and families and staying connected to one another in the limited means we have available to us, let us not lose sight that to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, to be a Christian, is to be a part of a community that gathers that confesses its own unworthiness and receives forgiveness and peace and the gift of the Spirit from the risen Christ who is in our midst. And so finally then, Christian community is being sent out into the world. Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. The doors are not to remain locked. 
this little group of disciples, this budding church, this embryonic Christian community we find in our text, with all of its frailty, with all of its weakness, with all of its imperfection, they are to be the means by which the forgiveness Christ won on the cross and secured in his resurrection, they are to be the means by which this goes out to the world. They are sent. We, friends, are sent. As sent as those who confess with Thomas that this Jesus is my Lord and my God. We are sent with the peace we are given as a gift, which is not just for ourselves, but is for others. It's for the world. We can't hold on to it only for ourselves. It's like air as we breathe it in. We also must breathe it out. Notice that verse, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Well, how does that happen? How do others come to believe? Well, it happens through the witness of the Christian community, the witness to Christ as they are sent into the world. Now, right now in our current circumstances, this being sent, it is both challenging as well as having particular opportunities. Because on the one hand, we are limited with how much we can interact with other people right now, aren't we? For many of you, some of the regular places into which you are sent as Christian disciples, they too are no longer going at the moment. You can't be there. The schools, the aged care homes, the soup kitchens, the local sports clubs, whatever they are, it's a challenge now as we can't go into those normal places. But on the other hand, I'd encourage you to consider right now where you are being sent. For those of you who live with family, I'd say that the very first place you are being sent right now is into your family. To be a disciple of Jesus there, to bring his peace and his gift of forgiveness to your spouse, to your children, to your parents, to whomever it is that you live with in that family unit or that household. I know that some of you now are working from home. Others of you, as we said, many of your regular activities aren't going and so you're spending more time with your family, more time with those who are close to you. And as much as we'd like to think that that's going to be all a wonderful thing, for many of us that is actually a challenge, isn't it? It's a new dynamic to work out how we relate to each other when we are spending so much time together. It can be stressful. It can take extra thought and care into how to make that work well. But let me encourage you today. That is where God is sending you right now to love and serve those people closest to you, to bring the gifts of the risen Christ to those around you, to be his disciple where he has sent you, even if right now that is just your immediate family, your household. Another thought at this time, though, are your physical neighbours, those who live right around your home. Because as we said, we are limited, aren't we? We can't go to a lot of our normal places. We interact with people. But if we are stuck at home for more time right now, perhaps think about those who live right next door. Now, even then, I know that we need to limit some of our interaction with the people who live close around us. But I've heard wonderful stories during this time of people getting to know their neighbours again, even if it's just talking over the back fence reconnecting with those whom God has placed right next to us in our life. That is where you are sent right now, people of God, with the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, with the peace of Jesus Christ, empowered by his Holy Spirit to be his sent ones, wherever you are. And God bless you in those endeavours. Christian community, 
It gathers regularly. It's made up of sinners. It's centered on Christ and it's sent out into the world. In the very short letter of 2 John, he writes this. Although I have much to write to you, I would rather not use paper and ink. And if I was to paraphrase this for us today, I'd put it this way. Although I have much to say to you and we have much to do, I'd rather not use a website and YouTube and Facebook. Instead, John writes, I hope to come to you and talk with you face to face so that our joy may be complete. Dear friends in Christ, that is my prayer as well. Let this be our desire that we can meet together again face to face with Christ in our midst so that our joy may be complete. And on that same theme, let me close with one more quote from Bonhoeffer's life together, where he draws a conclusion from the quote that I read out earlier. He says, therefore, let him who until now has had the privilege of living a common Christian life with other Christians, praise God from the bottom of his heart. Let him thank God on his knees and declare it is grace, nothing but grace, that we are allowed to live in community with Christian brothers and sisters. God grant it to us, for Jesus' sake. Amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.